If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible donation at lptv.org. Lakeland Public Television presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Welcome to Common Ground. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. In this two-segment episode, join Eileen Kulseth of Cross Lakes The Cottage Place as she creates a functional work of art, turning a baking dish on her potter's wheel. Then come along with first-time author Julia Lee for her book release of Seven Stones. I'm Eileen Kulseth from Cross Lake, Minnesota. Today we're going to create an oval casserole that has two parts to it that are interesting. One is wheel thrown and one is hand built. So to combine the two pieces together is the trick. The piece that I'm going to make is an oval casserole and this part is the rim that will be wheel thrown and it is four pounds. What I'm doing right now is wedging the clay and the purpose of this is really important that you are getting the molecules compressed. And the more you prepare your clay, the less chance of things cracking in the firing process in the kiln. I go one direction and then I compress it into an oval and then I turn it, face it towards me and do it again. It's similar to kneading bread dough, just heavier, thicker. Now the test of it is to cut it. Cut it with a wire tool and look to see, are there any air bubbles? No. So you put it back together like a puzzle piece and compress it some more. If it's a really big piece, you want to keep wedging it because you don't want it to crack. Now what I'm doing is beginning to form it into a ball so I can throw it on the wheel. And it's ready. All right, first thing that we're going to do is called throwing. Okay, I'm getting this prepared to center. One thing I've found that's key is the more accurate you can get it as far as being symmetrical in the center of your wheel, the easier it goes. I'm just doing that to connect it. Okay. As a potter, you don't want to have friction, and that's why you're going to see me continually put water on the clay. First step, I'm just gonna connect it to the wheel head by pushing down. And now it's connected, so now I'm gonna start centering it. If you, you can see my hands are moving around because the clay is moving it. As a potter, you need to be able to tell the clay what it's going to do and so you need to push as hard as you can. Keep your hands as steady and strong and still. Okay, now it's centered. Now what I need to do, because I'm gonna make a large oval casserole, I need to spread this clay out. And so I will begin to do that by just pushing it out before I shape it into a ring. You go out as far as, like it's gonna get too thin if I go any farther. So 
So now it's time to put a hole in the center. And the thing that's unusual about this step is that usually you don't want a hole in the bottom of your pot. But I do. Okay, now I need to bring the ring out. So I'm going to be pushing very hard to the right. You just don't want the clay to be in a puddle of, of water because it weakens the clay. I have it stretched out as far as I want it. And I'm just starting to define the wall. And now it's time to pull the wall up. Okay. Everything now will be a very slow, controlled pressure. Sliding up. And another thing that makes this design visually pleasing is that the rim will be wider and have some bulk to it. Another thing I've learned through the years is that edges, rims of pottery need to not be sharp. So you want to dull the edges, get them a little bit rounded, and then there's less chipping that happens. Then you use a chamois and you lay it on there lightly and put pressure on it like a feather touch and lift it off slowly. The next step is to get it off the wheel. So I make a groove on the inside at the very base of it and a groove on the outside. And when I do that, sometimes I get clay that bunches up. I want to clean up the edge that formed from making that groove. Okay, now I'm going to take this wire and actually it would be wise if I just put water in front of it so it will slide. You hold on to it tight and I'm going to seesaw it through, there we go, and bring it straight across and out. and now it's separated from the wheel. Okay. Since this is a two-day process, I came over here yesterday and I made another rim. It needed time to dry so it would be leather hard. And this is the condition it's in right now. So I can move it, shape it. Okay. Now I'm going to create a base for it, which I'll create on my slab roller. Since the wall is a certain thickness and it's less than a half an inch, so on my slab roller I have different measurements and right now I have it set at 3 8 and then you flip it back, so I stretched it out widthwise and then you just grab it and pull it and it gives you an even consistency. first step is to draw a line around the perimeter of my casserole to know what to cut away. Okay, my perimeter is drawn and now I can cut it away. Peel the excess away, over to the side. This is the best time to sign your piece. Okay, now it's ready to attach to the ring. When you put pieces of clay together, you want them to make sure that they're not going to pull apart. And so you use a technique that's called scoring. And it's basically drawing X's with a stylist in the clay. And then the same way I have to do it on the back side. Okay. I just want to make sure 
it feels kind of like slip, which is just wet clay. You flip it over, connect it to your perimeter base by just very carefully putting pressure and, and moving it back and forth. I can tell if it's going to be connected. Now, it's connected, but it doesn't look very good, so we have to blend it in. And I just use wooden tools. It's connected, use a tool and just bring the clay up and attach it to the side. So it's like a rough attachment first, and then you go back and you smooth it. And now I am going to smooth with just continual Use your fingertip to smooth it. I need two handles, so I've made one, but now I need to make a, another one. It's about three eighths. And I'll use my first handle as my template. I want to have a smooth, graceful look to it, so I don't want any angles. I want it to be more organic looking. All right, do they match? If they don't match exactly, you can squish it into place. Okay, now it's time to attach it. Symmetry is what I want, so I want them to be on opposite sides. Okay, so I'm going to take a ruler, put it in the center, eye it up to see that it's in the middle. Just set my handle, handle in the center, and I made marks with my fingernail, and now I know where to attach it. When I attach the clay to clay, I want to use scoring marks. On both pieces. And I use water as my glue. And you just push. And that handles on. Next one. Attach the scored marks, apply pressure, and just smoothing it. So I guess I would say I accomplished what I was aiming for. Julia Lee. I'm an author living in Bemidji. Originally I'm from southeastern Wisconsin and my husband and I moved up to the North Woods three and a half years ago. He got a job at Lakeland News as a sports reporter. I had been a teacher in Wisconsin and when we moved to Minnesota I decided I would pursue my lifelong dream of writing a book. Originally it was just going to be a book about Scotland and Celtic lore, Celtic history, because that's my background, that's what I've always loved. Moving up to the Northwoods changed my book entirely. It really changed my perspective on writing as well. I learned all about a culture I had never experienced before, um, the Ojibwe culture up here, and 
through researching it, I discovered parallels between my own heritage, Scottish and Celtic, and Ojibwe culture, and I thought that was beautiful. I, I thought it spoke a lot about us as human beings. So I decided I need to write a book about this to show other people these beautiful parallels. So that's what I began doing. I started working on the manuscript for Seven Stones in May of 2011. And I was done with the manuscript in May of 2012 through all the research and writing. Um, and in this story, I combine Scottish culture and Ojibwe culture. And I really play with especially the uh, dream mythology that you find in both cultures. The story is an Ojibwe girl living in the Midwest moves to Scotland with her family and she begins having these terrifying nightmares. And it, it turns out, of course, they are more than dreams. They are windows into Scotland's turbulent past. And there is a connection with this girl who's been lost to history that my main character has to figure out before she can discover her own identity. I had this idea for the story in my head forming about Scottish culture originally. And then I started learning about Ojibwe culture and I thought, oh, I really want to mix these two cultures together to show the beauty of both cultures. And the decision to make Keelan, my main character, Ojibwe, was really scary because I did not have the cultural knowledge. I literally would sit there and agonize. I'm like, oh, I really want to tell her side of the story, her perspective because Native American culture is marginalized in the United States. And I wanted to bring that to the forefront. I did not want a stereotypical story. Uh, I think those do more harm than good, absolutely. And I wanted to have something original, something that really showed the beauty of the culture and showed my main character as a human being. I didn't really want her to be, oh, she's a Native American character and I'm a white author. I'm not trying to write from a Native perspective. I'm not trying to write from a white perspective. I write from a human perspective, and I'm writing about humans and the human experience. And part of that is culture and how we identify with it. I was afraid people would be angry. I was afraid people wouldn't understand. I was afraid people would just see my skin color and judge, like, she doesn't know anything about it. Her book is terrible, sort of thing. Luckily, thank goodness for Anton Troyer. <laughs> He's a wonderful human being. I used a lot of his books in my research. I visited the Millex Band of Ojibwe Museum where I had several people helping me out. They let me use their resources. I contacted the Native American Languages Association and a lovely woman there, Laura Reddish, helped me with the names. And through this, I not only got a better story, but I feel like I am a better person because I got to learn all about this, this other culture and again, see the similarities. And so the more I feel like you can see yourself in another culture or see yourself in a character in a story, the better off you are, the more open-minded you are. And I did a lot of research and I tried to be incredibly cultural sensitive because Native American culture has been stereotyped and skewed and I wanted to bring the beauty to people. And so people go, oh, that's not different from me. That's, that's the same. And I feel that is the point of, of literature to broaden your mind. And if people say, well, she's a white author. She can only write about white characters. That's a slippery slope to, well, you're white, you should only read about white characters. And that gets you into a smaller and smaller box as opposed to what reading is all about, is just breaking on those boxes and those restrictions. So for me, it's a slow process, but a day where I can get three to five good pages written, that's a good day. And then there are days where you just like, go, you're inspired and you're to zip through a chapter. But for me, it's usually, I have to be able to visualize everything and kind of put myself in the scene and then I will be able to convey it to my audience. Now, the editing process, oi. <laughs> if writing a manuscript is like giving birth, I feel like the editing process is like labor and backwards. Like, oh, you get the labor pains during editing because here you are, you have this manuscript and it's like your baby and, and you're presenting it to the world and then you have an editor who's fab, my editor is fabulous, but the first thing she told me is, Julie, I love your book. We have to cut up a hundred pages. <laughs> like a knife to the heart. I couldn't, I was like, but I thought you loved it. She's like, oh, I do, but you know. <laughs> For me, because I have to go into the scene and see everything, I add tons of detail. And so it was more of trimming away all these details that helped me as a writer visualize the world I was creating and then the editor, my editor Angela, helped me trim away the excess so my readers could engage with that world. Writing the original manuscript took one year. Editing took almost three. <laughs> so editing 
is definitely the hard part. You know, you get done with your, your manuscript and you're like, yay, I finished my manuscript, now it's time to really work. <laughs> Oh, the book release party was fabulous. It was more perfect than I could imagine. Huh. So it has a lot of significance too. We had the book release party in Prairie Bay in Baxter. And that is actually where my publishers and I first met. They were speaking at a Minnesota publishing panel. And I decided as an aspiring writer, I was like, oh, there's gonna be publishers there. I'm going to go and meet them. And then one of them is going to fall in love with me. And that's exactly what happened. So I went to this publishing panel and listening to all these different publishers from Minnesota give advice to aspiring authors as to how to get published and publishing tips. And I heard Chip and Jean of River Place Press talking and I thought, man, I love the sound of this publishing house. I love these, these two publishers. I really, I have to meet them. So after everyone was done speaking, <sighs> I squared my shoulders and I walked up to them and as charming as possible, and I, I told them who I was and that I, I was just finishing up a manuscript. And then we started talking back and forth. I told them a little bit about my book and they, they were local from the Brainerd Lakes area. And they, they said, well, why don't we get a cup of coffee sometime? So I was floored. I was like, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah, that'd be cool, I guess. You know, whatever. <laughs> so a few weeks later, I got an email from them and they said, hey, we're available for coffee. Why don't we meet? And I was like, yes, okay, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whenever time. So I went there, but luckily I had my synopsis with me. And I casually slipped it across the table when they asked, so tell us more about your book. And I was like, well, just so happens I brought a copy of the synopsis. And they loved it and they asked me to send them a few chapters and I did. They read through them and they asked for the rest of the manuscript when I was done with it. So for the next month, I wrote, 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 wrote as much as I could, got it done in May, sent it to them. And then a few months later they said, yep, mm -hmm. we like your manuscript. We'd like, we'd like to work with you on this. So. There is the unicorn dragon. It's finished. Uh, I did what I could. <laughs> That's good. Well, Cat's Book Deck was my first book signing after the book release party, which went fantastic. So to say I was nervous is an understatement. I wanted everything to be perfect, and I was thinking, you know, in Brainerd, I had lived there for three and a half years, and I had a, a bunch of really supportive and wonderful friends, a really great support net. We sold over 100 copies of the book at the book release party. And so to go from there to Cat's Book Deck, I honestly didn't know what to expect. And I get there, and Cat is wonderful, and of course, the cats. <laughs> I knew at least the cats would be there. <laughs> so to kind of transition from my safety net of people I had known and encouraged me throughout the writing process to going to Bemidji where I, I had moved there relatively recently and didn't know a whole lot of people. I wasn't sure what to expect, whether anyone would show up at a book signing and luckily people did show up. I was so relieved. Everybody who walked through the door, I could have kissed them because <laughs> I was just so happy to, to talk about my book, to sell copies of my book. As an author, it is so important to go out and make a presence and network and meet people. Like with anything else, it's not what you know necessarily, but who you know. And so as an author, I really have learned the value of conferences and panels and retreats, anywhere where you can collaborate and work with other authors, meet people. You never know who you're going to meet or who's gonna help you get better at your craft and just have a better overall perspective of writing. And another thing I've definitely learned along the same vein is how much marketing it takes to be a local author because you are essentially trying to promote yourself. And so in these book signing events and these author events, the more engaging you can be as a person, the more books you are going to sell, the more people are going to want to know you.
For the future, I am hoping that people, first of all, read my novel and like it and take something from it. It's a dream come true just knowing people are reading the words that I wrote and taking something from my story. I'm working currently on the sequel. This next book takes place in Minnesota on the reservation where her mother grew up. So it's taken me a lot longer to write because it's taken me a lot longer to research. I guess advice that I would have for new authors would be write whatever you can. If you can get a, an article published in like say the Lake Country Journal or if you can get a story published in any sort of legitimate publication that's huge to kind of build up your resume. And don't be afraid to ask for advice or help, especially from local authors in your area and local artists. Look at what kind of resources are available in your area. I think it does such a world of good to have local resources like River Place Press, like the Region 2 Arts Council. It inspires artists and makes it feel like, yes, I can do this and my work can reach people. There are so many talented writers and artists that kind of, I feel like, get lost in the shuffle. And having the local presses you can get these quality artists and these voices and it promotes, I think, not only writing and artists in the community, because people in the community can go, hey, I know that person, hey, that person is a writer, I've always kind of wanted to do that. And that's what I've noticed when I'm touring and talking to people, they're like, I've, I've always wanted to write a book or I started writing a book and they want to know how I did this and I, and I let them know there are these local resources. If you're interested in writing, you know, there, there is the Region 2 Arts Council, there are local presses that produce quality work and I think that just kind of like the eat local movement that's going on, shop local. Well, this is sort of like read local. There are artists in your community and by supporting them, you're supporting the arts and you're promoting future generations to go, I have a story that I want to tell. I'm going to do this too. Thanks so much for watching. Join us again next week on Common Ground. If you have an idea for a common ground piece that pertains to North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3014. To view any episode of Common Ground online, visit us at lptv.org. episodes or segments of Common Ground, call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People, November 4, 2008. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.